You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. My home here on Vancouver Island backs onto a forest. The other night, I woke up to the sound of an owl outside my window. As I lay listening in the darkness, I thought of the Whiskey Creek victims. I found myself wondering if they had nights like this, where they were able to rest and listen to the beauty of their forest surroundings. I'd like to think they did. In telling their stories, it was my intention to raise the awareness of an event that seemed to have gotten lost, forgotten, too soon. I always hope listeners connect with victims as humans to make it tougher to write off Tyler and the others as simply addicts doing bad things. The fallout and the reactions to Whiskey Creek have surprised me. So much so that I wanted to share some of them with you. I'm Laura Palmer, and this is Fury, Fear, and Solace, The Impact of Whiskey Creek, Season 5 of Violent Crime. My goal is to pursue truth, and in the world of true crime, to pursue justice. I'm victim-responsive, but I'm not victim-driven. And that means while I will always listen to the victim's families, I still have to do what I believe to be right. Sometimes families are divided on how they want to proceed. Police, too, will have their views. This is to say that not everyone is going to be happy. So here to help me sift through the responses to Whiskey Creek, the good and the bad, are two of my Frequency podcast colleagues, Jordan Heath-Rawlings and Stephanie Phillips. Okay, let's start with the tough stuff. Laura, you received a pretty scathing note right out of the gate. Steph, maybe you want to read that for us? Yeah, of course. So this person writes, You say these people were not the type to light up the room. Did you ever meet them? That was exactly what you said. How dare you post this garbage about these beautiful people? My best friend has to suffer because her mother was murdered. Did you ever stop to think that this just opens old wounds and rubs salt in them? Everyone made her out to be a drug addict who loved no one. She was beautiful and sweet. She loved her children dearly. Shanda was an amazing woman, and I'm lucky enough to hear the good stories of her every day. So we've edited these for clarity and trimmed them to save time, but that comment landed in my personal Facebook page after the first episode dropped. And I responded immediately, thanking the person for the feedback and letting them know that I had actually gone to great lengths to speak with Shanda's family and that I needed to respect that for their own reasons, they chose not to participate in the podcast. And then the next day, this message appeared in my Twitter inbox. I've got that message here. Hi there. I'm listening to your podcast and one of the victims is my mom. I wanted to find you because I'm enraged about the way you're portraying this story. My mom was an amazing woman and the people who knew her before her addiction have good things to say. You don't know anything and the way you're talking about the dead and bringing this back up is incredibly disrespectful. So given the nature of the work that I do, there's always going to be the possibility that what I broadcast will be hurtful to someone. And I am fully aware of the impact island crime can have for good, and in this case, for harm. So I, I do what I can to mitigate the harm, but it's not always possible. And for me, this was a good reminder that not only were the victims someone's sons or daughters, they were also parents. Sean was a dad, Shanda was a mom, and Tyler, too, was a step-parent. So there are kids involved here. 
So you've heard from these two people. What's the response been like from other family members? Have you heard from anyone else? Yeah, I spoke with someone close to the survivor who was relieved that their identities had been protected. And overall, they felt that the story had been presented in a fair way. I've also heard a few times from Tyler's family. His mother sent me this note. We are getting a lot of people we know getting in touch with us that had no idea of how Tyler's passing had happened and had just assumed it was an overdose. My heart grieves, but I am so proud and happy for all that you're doing to put Whiskey Creek and Tyler's murder on the forefront. So Tyler's mom mentions that she's happy. The case is getting more attention now. I know uh, when you do this that that is a goal for you. What is your sense of that compared to previous seasons or just compared to the way this was covered in the first place? So the launch of the podcast generated some fresh coverage in local papers and on radio here on Vancouver Island. And the podcast itself was number one on the Apple podcast charts across Canada for a time. So certainly the story of Whiskey Creek has become much more widely known. I'll jump in here with a a couple of listeners who wrote in about that on Reddit. So Prairie Islander wrote, I listened to the episode last night while cooking dinner. The thing that really stuck out to me is how much I had to search my memory for this case. I was living up in Campbell River at the time, and I honestly barely remember this. I remembered hearing about it, the initial response, and then nothing, which isn't like me at all. I try to keep very informed on these types of situations and cases. So that's honestly something that's caused me to do some inward looking, which I appreciate. And there was also this note along the same lines. I just started this podcast today and was also shocked that I had zero recollection of hearing about it in the news. I wondered if there was also less coverage due to the pandemic. But after starting the podcast, I feel like the police maybe just care less about these kind of murders. So on the one hand, awareness of the case itself, which is positive. On the other hand, the increased profile also reinvigorated the kind of victim blaming that was prevalent when the murders first occurred. Laura, you tell me about that. So in response to news stories about the podcast, there were lots of comments about that on all of the social media platforms. A guy named Mark commented, hey, not a big loss to society. And a fellow named Josh chimed in with, leave it unsolved. It got rid of a few drains on society. And that debate was happening on Reddit as well. Someone wrote the following note, drug addicts killing fellow drug addicts. Why glorify this crap by putting it on a podcast? We get it. They were loved and they were someone's children. But the fact of the matter is, it appears that the trash took out the trash. You can dress it up and make it a pretty little fable. The place was a festering shithole in a gravel pit, from what I saw in the news coverage. Unlike your cutesy illustration of a quaint trailer in the woods. Ouch. I know, it it was um, a pretty mean thing to write, uh, but it did elicit this response from someone else who wrote, Drug dealer, addict, homeless, whatever. They don't deserve to be murdered. I can't believe how cold people can be. I hope you never need empathy or understanding for your downfalls in life. So some of that online commentary came from people who would not have been familiar with the area. But I also spotted this from someone who had a firsthand encounter at Whiskey Creek. Steph, can you read this one? Yeah, for sure. I'm an off-roader and frequent that area. I came across that group a few times. They made sure to tell my group we weren't welcome in that area even though they were squatting on mosaic land and a recreation area. That whole encampment was bad news and rife with criminal activity and deplorables. The series began with an email from Tyler's mom. She was frustrated at the pace of the investigation, and also she was grieving in secrecy. Now that the story's out there and has been heard by so many people, what kind of reaction are you getting, Laura, from people who just knew Tyler? So although I didn't name Tyler's last name, people are putting the pieces together who knew him, and I am hearing from quite a few people who knew Tyler, uh, including this person. 
I grew up on this part of the island and devoured true crime podcasts, so obviously I was drawn to island crime. Something from the very start of Whiskey Creek left me a bit haunted and shaken. I had a weird feeling. Using the few small details given in the podcast, a glance at old yearbooks and a quick Google search, and I found Tyler. We were in the same grade from elementary to graduation. We weren't close, but friendly in the way of familiarity of saying hi to someone daily in passing for 10 years, riding the school bus, having classes together, and overlapping social groups. He was exactly as his mom described, tall, quiet, a bit shy, and super nice with a kind of squinty, cute smile. I even remember his first truck. Even though I hadn't seen him in 20 plus years, I very much remember Tyler, and he was a great and kind person. I know there are so many more people like me who would have felt punched in the gut at this news. To anyone else who knew Tyler, I'm so very sorry for your loss. And there was also this lovely memory from a writer on Reddit. Thank you. Tyler was a stepfather and family man for the majority of his life. He was shy and reserved, but would always crack a smile and a quiet hello your way when you saw him. The last couple of years of his life are not indicative of the man he was. They show the struggle he was going through. No one deserves this, but Tyler especially didn't. So hearing from people like that who knew Tyler confirmed what I'd been told by those closest to him. Here's a few more notes on Tyler's character. He was super kind very sweet. He absolutely needs to be remembered as an amazing person that deserves to rest in peace, and his entire family know the community is deeply saddened and affected by the loss of Tyler. I remember Tyler helped my mom when she was going through a rough time in her addiction. She had nowhere to go, and Tyler fed her and let her stay with him at his place for a couple of weeks till she got sober. Tyler giving her a safe place helped her mind and body and spirit at a time no one was able or willing. This was something my mom never forgot and has always been grateful for. I also have this one to share from a woman named Jessica. Tyler and I went to junior high and high school together. He was so, so nice. Pretty shy around us girls, but he was always kind. I've often wondered if he was okay. I'd see him walking around downtown before COVID. It was sad to see him lost in addiction. It's even sadder that this unjust tragedy has happened to his family. I'm so sorry for everyone affected by this. And there's another one from someone named Chantel. So, so very sad. Tyler was such a good hearted soul. He is missed. Let's find justice for him, his family, and all of us. Who did this? Let's catch this SOB. Speaking of catching the SOB, Laura, I know once these podcasts debut, you often get notes about the case that you may not have seen before you record it. So what about the reaction to the murders in general? Are you hearing about people who know this case well? Yes, I've received a number of communications from people who allege they have inside knowledge of the murders. Everyone seems to agree this hit was retaliation for something Sean McGrath was involved with. Now, these are people who won't go on the record or tell me how they came to the information they hold. And so I can't do much with most of it. But I also received some correspondence from someone who asked to remain anonymous, but does have a connection to both Shanda and the survivor. This note has been edited to remove any specific references which may identify this person. They write, Hi, Laura. I'm listening to your podcast about the Whiskey Creek killings. It touches home for me on two levels. Firstly, I live next door to a family member of Shanda. Shanda was loved by her family, and the reason they won't talk about it is to protect her children, as they are of the age to be on social media. They are a wonderful family, who love her very much, and they choose not to make this her legacy. 
On a couple of occasions, I met our kids. They are beautiful people. They don't deserve to know all the sadness, as they already have to deal with it. My son, who is now deceased, was an addiction worker at a recovery home. This is where the survivor ended up after he was discharged from the hospital. He was trying to get clean and sober. He left rehab after the mandatory stay period of 90 days. I've never met the survivor, but for some reason he trusted my son, and my son tried to help him get clean and sober. My now deceased son cared about him, and although lost contact, followed his story closely. The boy is a victim of bad associations and drug use. He is literally fighting for his life. When people are warning you, Laura, they mean it. Be safe and be wise. Well, let's talk about that. Laura, how are you handling the safety concerns around this series? So I would say this series is the one in which I have received the most warnings about my own personal safety. And some of that has to do with the fact that it is a much more recent crime and the the magnitude of the violence as well, I would say. So I have had people telling me to back off or to drop the story altogether. There hasn't been anything that I would consider to be a specific threat to me. But I have had a couple of listeners call me gutsy or even brave for just telling this story at all. So I would say I don't see it that way, that this is Canada and I'm simply a journalist asking questions and telling a story in a fact-based and fair way. And I do take my personal security seriously. I'm happy to hear that. Tyler's mom wondered if her son was being held captive at Whiskey Creek. Now, after everything you've learned, what do you think about that? So given what I learned from Tyler's family and from the response to them from the police, it seems quite likely to me that Tyler's addiction and his gentle nature would have made him an easy target to be coerced by someone like Sean McGrath. But unless someone who was actually living out at Whiskey Creek at the time comes forward, it's possible we will never know for certain. What about the allegations that were raised by Kelly Morris that uh, Sean McGrath was hurting people up at the encampment? I know it's hard to corroborate any of this stuff, but were you able to find anything on that? Well, there is a lot of that being discussed here on the island, and I have heard allegations that McGrath was responsible, for example, for the disappearance of a woman here on the island. One person told me my series includes only 10% of the information about what was really going on with McGrath out at Whiskey Creek. But here's something I've observed in other unsolved cases I've worked on. The rumors, the urban myths, they just grow and grow. And even at this point, three years on in death, Sean McGrath has achieved an almost larger-than-life notoriety. But I have no direct first-hand knowledge of some of these allegations. And I'm mindful that Sean McGrath has a son and a dad who are, of course, grieving his death. I checked in with the Vancouver Island Integrated Major Crime Unit just this morning to see if they had any updates. And once more, I was informed that there is no update on this matter. Maybe lastly, we can talk about the place itself. As somebody mentioned earlier in one of the comments, the cover art for this series is very evocative. The series is called Whiskey Creek. It's a reference to the community where the murders took place. And you do describe how beautiful the area is, but you also point out the kind of seedier side to the place. How does the community feel about this characterization about being spotlighted by the show? Well, one local listener did take a bit of an issue with part of my characterization of the place. Yes, Andrea wrote, One correction. I'm loving the podcast and I live in Qualicum. However... Most of us do not drink Lucky Beer. We have many craft breweries around and have a wealth of good beer options. The surf shop here is there because many travel to Tofino to surf, and it's right on the way there for rentals, etc. 
the Yellowstone hillbilly twang makes us laugh daily. We are pretty civilized here. So this makes me chuckle. And on top of that, we also had a comment from an Australian listener about the music. Michelle writes, hi, I'm from Down Under and I love your podcast. Can I ask what the song is at the end of the show? I love it. Okay, big shout out to Michelle for raising that question about the song and prompting me to learn a bit more about it. I was searching for a piece of music that would have a traditional old country feel, something with a melancholy tone. Tyler's mom had told me he liked that style of music, and so I wanted to infuse it into the podcast as a kind of tribute to Tyler's memory. My wristwatch is broken. My shoes are untied. Time is a ticking, and so is the tide. But I am not worrying. Things are what they are. Come rain or come shine or a shooting star. The song I found is called By and By, although to me it's become known as Tyler's song. I discovered the tune on Epidemic Sound, which is the catalog where I source a lot of the music and sound you hear on Island Crime. I had to do a little digging to find out that it was actually written and performed by a Swedish folk singer named Henrik Nagy. I'm 45 years old. I started out pretty early. I remember at the age of seven getting my first real instrument. And from that day on, it's it's been pretty much everything I do. My dad was a musician, also my brother is a musician. So we pretty much grew up on the bandstand next to our dad playing like oldies. Dance music, Bills, Elvis, old country songs. Mostly, he writes and sings in Swedish. Sweden is a long way from Whiskey Creek. When I learned that that, that my song By and By had found an audience in that part of the world, it just proves that music is a strange thing. I tracked him down on Instagram. The night he got my email, he was getting set to perform a series of concerts. But he wrote back right away. And I heard that By and By had become a bit of a theme song for, for Tyler. I mean, as a songwriter, if anyone can find any comfort in any of my songs, I think it's, it's, it's the best you can hope for as a songwriter. So it makes me proud. I mean, it's amazing. As a result of this query, I'm following Henrik on Instagram and have listened to more of his music, which is really quite great. For anyone who wants to follow my work, my songwriting, my songs, even though most of them nowadays are in Swedish, you can find me at all the usual places like Spotify and iTunes and YouTube, and I'm all over the place. Thank you, Steph and Jordan, for helping me sort through all of this feedback on Whiskey Creek. You're welcome, Laura, and thanks for all the work you do on this show with us at Frequency. Yes, thanks, Laura, and thanks for including us. If you have information about the Whiskey Creek murders, please call the Vancouver Island Integrated Major Crime Unit's tip and information line at 250-380-6211. I'm Laura Palmer. And this is Whiskey Creek, Island Crime, Season 5. I'll leave you today with a little more music from Henrik Nagy. The song It's a Beautiful World Out There is a song about taking a step into the unknown. I think way too many people spend way too much time deciding beforehand what a new experience will be like. So I guess it's a song about letting go of some some fears and actually try something. Go visit a new place, you know, travel somewhere, meet new people. Yeah, and it takes guts to do it, you know. We're pretty comfortable within our comfort zone and we, we need to leave that every now and then to grow. I think the song is about that. It's a beautiful world out there. There is something we need It's a leap of faith 
Step away from the comfort zone and be a little brave So take a look around you How far can you see? How far do you think you can run Standing on your own knees? It's a beautiful world out there Just don't pass on the dare If you have the will and the moment to spare Beautiful world out there. It's a beautiful world out there. It can be a bit frightening. It's something you don't know. You need a little enlightening. It'll make you grow. It's a beautiful world out there. Just don't pass on the dead. If you have the will. Oh, if you have the 